I'm Keith Nab from the math department, and welcome to the second of three talks that we're going to have this semester. Um, this is our STEM series, and that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And today we're delighted to have Michelle Garrity. Uh, she is an uh, automotive engineer, and she works on safety and seatbelt performance. And she's going to talk about how she uses uh, math and science and a lot of the things that we see in our classrooms and how that uh, manifests itself uh, in her day-to-day -day job. So um, you will have a chance to ask her questions at the end, so you could just hold those to the end. And again, we are absolutely delighted to have her, so let's give a welcome to Michelle Garrity. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, I am an alumnus of Marine Valley Community College. I graduated back in 2009, so I've been out of school for four years, and it feels nice to be back on a college campus. So um, I'm going to just talk to you briefly about what I do at work, and some of you may be wondering, how is math ever going to be used in real life? Why do I need to learn all these integrals and calculus? What is the purpose of that? So I'm going to go into some depth into how you can use that in real life, and hopefully give you a different perspective on math. This is from the integration beat. I don't know if any of you were in that recently. Were any of you in Mr. Nab's class for integration? No? OK. <laughs> so how math is behind your vehicle safety features? First, I'm just going to discuss briefly what is engineering, in case some of you don't know. Um, basically, give you an overview of what Honda and Acura products are. When I started working there, I wasn't all too familiar with them. And also just give you a brief description of how do we design and produce cars, and then you guys are the consumers that buy them. Also, who approves your vehicles? How do we get these vehicles approved by the government and able to sell them to you guys? What regulations do we have to pass? And then also, what does Honda R&D do in their crash safety department? And then as well, as a student, I know that I would have been interested in how do you actually get to be a safety engineer. So I'll kind of briefly go through that. And then after the presentation, I have some giveaways for you guys, as well as I'll be available for questions. And then um, I have a seatbelt retractor that was tested and taken apart, so you guys can take a look at that. So what is an engineer? Basically, engineers come in can design anything. Um, we have civil engineers, industrial engineers, electrical and mechanical. I specifically have a background in mechanical engineering with a biomed concentration. So I took a lot of anatomy classes, biomechanics, but I also went through the whole mechanical degree program. So you can design highways, chairs, mechanical pencils. Your iPads are designed by engineers. Um, you know, snowboards, and if you're interested in the biomed field, then you, you probably have heard of box. These are the prosthetics that can help amputees run again. So we're into a lot of innovation, design, testing, creating, and problem solving. Engineers love to problem solve. They see a problem and they're like, how can we come up with a solution? How can we make a product better? And so if you're not familiar with Honda and Acura, Honda is um, our, our basic line, but then the Ac Acura part of it is a luxury line. So that's where you get more of the expensive vehicles that have um, tip-top interiors and exteriors and performances. So um, some of these you may recognize. Does anyone here drive a Honda or Acura? All right, good. <laughs> Just in case you don't know, Honda and Acura have um, top safety picks, so they are rated as the top for having uh, very good safety features. And then, I don't know if any of you have heard that Acura NSX is going to be coming out in a couple years. Fun sports car. <laughs> so, how are cars made? We have an LA styling studio that is in California, and basically, uh, Anyone that like, is into art and likes to design the look of the car, they are in LA. And so they will design um, basically the, out, the exterior features. And then after that, they actually create a 3D model of the life-size vehicle, but out of clay. <laughs> I've never seen this myself, but I think that's very fascinating. 
And then back in Ohio, that's where I work, um, is the Honda R&D facility. R&D stands for Research and Development. So we have um, software tools called uh, CAE that basically simulate what will happen in a car crash. And then we actually spend millions and millions of dollars to create prototype cars and smash them into walls. So that's the fun part. And then in Alabama, after the car is designed and we've already tested it and we're like, okay, this is pretty safe. This is safe. It's passing regulations. Now we can go ahead and actually make it so that people can start buying them. So in Alabama, we have the assembly line where the cars go through and people put the different um, components inside and then at the end of the line, you have a completed vehicle. So what are the software programs and like why are they beneficial? Um, basically, if you were to uh, optimize your product, you're not going to want to spend millions and millions of dollars because then you're losing millions and millions of dollars. So software programs are created to make sure that the vehicle will pass um, testing before we actually test it. And that way we can say, oh, this had a failure in our computer model. Let's not create that and spend millions of dollars. That's just a waste of money. So the simulation programs help us to kind of predict what will happen in an actual car crash. Sorry, I apologize, my videos are not working today. <laughs> um, so at Honda, I work with a lot of dummies. Yes, that's a joke, but I'm not very good at those. <laughs> um, so we have over here uh, dummies that are as small as a six-month-old child. And you have the six-year-olds, and then this is our uh, female size. And then it goes all the way up to a five foot, 10, 10 inch male that um, weighs about 172 pounds. And when I'm putting him in the vehicles for testing, I don't pick him up. <laughs> I make sure that I use a crane because they're incredibly heavy. And I don't know if any of you can guess, but the dummies themselves can go all the way up to $200,000. There's lots of instrumentation that goes into these dummies. You have accelerometers that take the moment of the head and neck as you're rotating about certain axes, and then also gyroscopes that um, can take the moments. So there's a lot of math and technology that goes into just the dummies themselves. After every car crash, the dummies get damaged in some way. So we have an entire dummy tech lab where they go and they open up the dummies and they make sure everything is calibrated correctly. And this is why they cost so much money, because we have to spend thousands of dollars to make sure that we're getting the accurate readings. So here are some things that, um, these are the crash halls that we use as a runway. So we take the prototype cars and we um, shoot them down a very long hallway and into a crash barrier. And that's, that's how you test the cars. Um, just having a huge facility helps. And this is called our Transportation Research Center. So yes, we do have an eight mile race course track just behind our Honda building where we design. So we'll take the cars out and we'll test drive them, make some sharp turns, accelerate really fast, brake really hard, and make sure that all the seat belts are working and everything is safe in your vehicle. And this is fascinating. I don't know who does this, but there are some engineers that take these cars and drive them for eight hours a day for months to make sure that your cars, when you're using them, the durability is sustainable and it'll last you a couple years. <laughs> okay, so in order to market our cars, um, have any of you heard of I IIHS? It's basically um, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. If you're ever wondering how do cars get these five-star ratings for safety, well, this is how. Um, all these car companies have to pass regulation, but not every car company tries to get five-star ratings. The only reason that we're trying to is because we're marketing to you guys. You're not going to you know, automatically go for a car that's rated for two stars. You want to get a car that's five-star. So in order to get those ratings, we have to be approved by IIHS, Euro NCAP, NHTSA, and China NCAP. And there are many, many other marketing organizations that kind of take our cars, crash them into walls, and they say, all right, that's a five star. Let's market it as that. 
Honda and Acura, we sell to all um, parts of the world, so we have to pass all these regulations. Okay, I'm going to get out of my presentation real quick. And I want to show you this video that I took when I was at IAHS. This is called the moderate overlap test. It's a frontal crash. It was super loud and my camera didn't pick up everything, but you get the idea. <laughs> So this was actually um, oh, a Nissan Maxima that happened. And this actually got a poor rating. But I'm not trying to say by Honda or Acura. I'm just saying <laughs> a lot of people have, a lot of car manufacturers have trouble with this particular one because it smashes the tire into the driver. And it's very hard to protect for how is the car, the metal body, going to crush so that it crushes and deforms and absorbs all that energy but at the same time, it doesn't injure you. So this is something that manufacturers have a very hard time passing and getting five stars for. Okay, so I'm gonna go into um, what I am becoming expert in. This is called a seatbelt anchorage test. And basically, when you're in a frontal crash, your body, your car stops, right? But because of inertia, your body keeps moving and is loading up your seatbelt that you're wearing. And when you're loading into that seatbelt, you're pulling up on everything it's connected to, which is the seat itself, as well as the car body floor. So when you're going into that seatbelt, your seat is actually coming up with you and pulling up on that metal floor. The worst thing that could happen is if you rip that out of the car and then go flying through the windshield. So this is basically um, what I'm testing for, is to make sure that when you're in a frontal crash, you do not go flying out of the windshield. Granted that you're wearing your seatbelt. So this is our test setup. This is what a car looks like without anything inside of it, just the metal body itself. And these are, I like to call it the torture machine, because it literally there's these um, actuators that come out of the wall, and they have hooks on the end. And we hook them up to the seats and literally just rip them out. So here is our test setup. Um, we're taking uh, loads at the torso area, your lap area, and then the center of gravity of an actual person. And we're just pulling it as far as we can. So it loads up to about 3,000 pounds. Um, for those of you that are here uh, to basically see the math portion of it, so we take, um, we load it up for about 10 seconds all the way to 3,000, and then we start uh, holding it to see or you start to hear the metal body deforming. You start hearing the welds popping and the nails coming out of the body. And you're like, oh my gosh, are the seats gonna go flying towards the wall? But then they don't, so that's good. And that would cons be considered an okay passing test. This is an example of a failure. Um, so these huge spikes are what happens when the cars basically, or the seats basically fly out of the car. And I have a video. This was like one of my first tests that I ran, and I was freaking out. So I was like, we need to press the emergency brake. <laughs> If we had kept it going, it would have damaged our machine and went flying towards the wall. So <laughs> we had to stop that action. And then this is the deformation that you can see. Um, obviously, the cross member came flying through the floor, so we had to fix some of those welds there. All right, so um, I'll talk about IHS top safety pick and how you can get those five star ratings. Um, there are different ratings your car can get. They can get good, acceptable, marginal, or poor. And in order to get top safety pick, you have to get four out of the five tests that I'm about to go over 
as rated as good. Oh, that was one of the ones that don't work. Sorry about that. Okay, so the first one is the moderate overlap frontal crash test. That was the one video that I had shown at the beginning. Um, so basically what they're doing is they're making sure that 40% of your vehicle, uh, they have done extensive testing on this to come up with these numbers. Um, most frontal crashes cover at least 40% of the front of your vehicle. So when you're crashing in, they want to make sure that the driver's head and neck, all those forces are within range. And the reason that this dummy's face is painted is so that when your head hits the airbag, they want to make sure that the correct parts of your head are hitting the airbag and not the metal pillars of the car, because that would hurt, obviously. Um, and then these sensors, or these targets here, are representing all the sensors and the instruments that we put into the vehicle to measure the forces when you hit a barrier. This second one is called a small overlap frontal crash, and that is the one that manufacturers are struggling with the most because you are moving forward in your vehicle but also to the side. And this could happen when you're on a two-lane road coming, um, passing someone, and they just like nick the front of your car because they're texting or it's a drunk driver. So this is um, something that is actually very new and was instated into regulations about a year ago. Okay, and then I'll go into um, the side impact. I love watching the glass in these videos. So with these side impacts, um, this structure right here is basically simulating the height of an actual SUV coming into your car. Like let's say you're at a stoplight and you're making a left turn, but someone is trying to run the yellow, right? And then they kind of hit you from the side. So this is, that's an example of what that test would be meant for. So, um, and then as you can see right here in this picture, the dummy's face was painted, and when the airbag went off, you can see exactly where he hit on the airbag. And the engineers that are experts in this particular test, they try and make sure like, that they're not hitting off to the side of the airbag or um, that the airbag is deflating at the same, or inflating at the, same, at the right time. Timing is very crucial for this. Um, I work with the guys that are in sensor group, and they make sure that all the airbags go off at a particular force and at a particular time during your crash. Over here is um, a test called the roof crush. So basically, we're testing um, to see what happens in a rollover. You want to be able to crawl out of your vehicle during a rollover, and you want to make sure that your seatbelt does not lock up. So one of the things that we do is we take the car onto a platform and then I'm usually inside the vehicle, but it's kind of fun. And they basically tilt the vehicle all the way over on its side and make sure that all the seat belts are still unlocking so that when you're in a vehicle rollover, you can still get out and climb to safety. Um, so for roof crush, what we do is this uh, structure right here kind of presses down into the vehicle body on the roof, and it goes down at a certain force and a certain displacement. And as it keeps going, you can hear glass breaking and popping out of the windshields. So the um, best thing is if the more force that your vehicle can take at a certain displacement, the better rating that you'll get. And this is a chart to kind of show you um, how much displacement versus the ratio of the force and the weight compared to your vehicle. And then this is what I am trying, um, they are training me to become expert in, which is the whiplash testing. If any of you have ever been in a rear end collision, um, you know that whiplash injuries are the most common injuries that you can get. So what we do to simulate that is we don't actually use real cars because those are expensive. 
So we have a sled fixture right here that we shoot um, a lot of pressure and power into an, a pneumatic actuator. And it basically jolts the sled forward with the dummy and the seat inside. And it simulates what happens when you get hit from behind at 20 miles per hour. And there's a lot of things that go into this. You can't just sit the dummy in the seat and be like, all right, run the test. You actually have to make sure his elbows are at the right position, his hands are at the right position, his knees are a certain distance apart, his head is near the backrest, and everything is set accordingly. To set up this test, which looks so simple, it can take about an hour. <laughs> Pretty long time. Um, and then down here, so if any of you ever complain about your headrest being very uncomfortable, sorry about that. Just looking out for your safety. Um, the smaller back set that you have, so the distance from the back of your head to the head restraint, the smaller that gap is, the better protected you will be in a rear-end collision because this, um, this injury happens in less than a second, 0 0.09 seconds. That's all this test takes. Uh, let's see, get another video here. Oh, I don't have that uploaded, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so this is um, the pulse that we would shoot the sled fixture at. So the dummy would go flying across um, the sled runway at this acceleration and then, or at this velocity and then at this acceleration. And your head needs to contact the headrest at a certain time, at s about 70 milliseconds is what they would suggest as a five star rating. So like I was saying before, um, we're rated on the geometry of your headrest. You would think that your head restraint is so simple to create, right? It's just foam with two rods sticking out of it. But it's way more than that. Um, you have to make sure that, oop, oop, there it goes. You have to make sure that this gap right here is very small, as well as this height up here. And in order to get uh, five star ratings, you have to be in this green zone having 60 millimeters and then 70 millimeters of back set. And then for your dynamic portion, we, we also test um, the neck forces. So the particular dummy I use has very biofidelic um, vertebrae inside of them. So we test what happens at your lower lumbar, your thoracic, your uh, cervical, and then also what happens for your neck forces for your head, for your head uh, center of gravity. And so we have to make sure that you're landing right here. We're testing the neck tension, how far up does your head move, as well as your neck shear, which just sounds awful because shearing is going like this. So, okay. Um, also something that maybe you haven't thought of is seats are so, 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 so complex. When I first took apart a seat, I was like, Oh, holy cow, we're not to the center of it yet. <laughs> All right. Um, the foam is very important for rear collisions, surprisingly. So if your seat is not very comfortable or it's too soft or it's too stiff, the engineers that designed it may have realized, well, we need to make the foam stiffer in order for us to pass, or we may need to make this foam softer so that when you, when your car is moving and you're stopped at a red light, but someone rear ends you, your seat is going to keep moving, but you're still because of inertia. So we have to make sure that you sink into that seat, making your head closer to the head restraint. So this kind of shows you the displacement of the foam at a certain load. And this is basically measuring the stiffness. Here's some displacement. Um, so basically, we're taking uh, the velocity with respect to time and we're just integrating, and this kind of just shows us during the actual testing that we do, how much is the sled moving at a particular time? And we can kind of see when your neck, when your um, head hits the head restraint and judge it that way. And also we're trying to look at the energy of the sled. Um, the energy that you have during these crashes is very important. You wanna make sure that you, we are slowing down the energy that you exert onto the seat 
because obviously the slower that you go, the less injured you're going to get. Um, and then we also do some pedestrian testing. I don't have this video up, but um, basically what happens is we try and simulate an actual person just standing up, like on a street corner. And it's kind of weird, but when I started doing safety testing, I didn't realize that we also design cars to hit people safer. Does that make any sense? Like, so we're protecting for pedestrians as well to make sure that they don't get hurt when you accidentally hit them. Um, so this guy, he's just suspended by rope because he obviously can't stand by himself. But what happens in this video is a car just comes smashing into him and his femur and hips kind of get dislocated. Um, if you've ever heard of potentiometers, those are inside of this dummy and they kind of measure the displacement and the movement of your femur and your hips as you're moving. Um, because the SUV top comes about here. And then also we have load cells in here to kind of measure how hard is your head actually gonna hit the hood. Some interesting research. Oh, and then also I wanna mention, so this was kind of a shock to me, but at the Transportation Research Center, they also do testing. And for whiplash and frontal crashes, Sometimes, instead of using actual dummies, they'll use cadavers. <laughs> and the reason for that is because, um, obviously, you can get the best accurate readings of an actual human being by using cadavers. If you're using dummies, you have all the errors that can come along with the accelerometers and the gyroscopes and the potent potentiometers. In order to make sure that we get accurate readings from the dummies, everything has to be calibrated and that costs a lot of money. But if you have people that donate their body to science, you can get accurate readings from that. And I don't know, I guess it's interesting for the people that do it, but I would never want to do that. So I just can't imagine hooking up an accelerometer to someone's spine. No, thank you. <laughs> um, so anyways, the most gratifying part of what we do at Honda and other car manufacturers is saving lives. So the whole thing that I wanted to get, make sure that you guys got out of this was math can be used for really good purposes, such as saving people's lives. Um, the people that were in this accident actually walked away alive. Um, I'll be able to tell you some things that they've said about it. Um, these, these people, uh, one of them was a drunk driver, and this person actually had no broken bones, which is a big shock because it looks horrible. Um, the person that was in here, their legs were trapped, but uh, people were still able to get them out of the crash, as well as he only had like a broken elbow. So that was pretty awesome. Okay, I'm just going to read a short uh, letter that someone had wrote to us. Um, we have a, so in safety department, we have this huge scrapbook of all these letters and pictures that people send to us, thanking us for what we have done for them and for saving their family. Dear sir or madam, on July 21st, 2008, I was driving our 2005 Odyssey alone on Route 20. My wife and three children would typically be in the vehicle without me. As I proceeded on to my next stop, I had no idea of the nightmare about to ensue. A drunk driver traveling 50 miles per hour in a Chevrolet Avalanche struck me head on in my lane after the vehicle in front of me swerved out of his way. I never even saw him coming. The severe impact crushed the Odyssey, the force of his vehicle pushing the front end of the Honda back so far that my waist and legs were trapped and hidden. The responding police officers thought I was deceased at first, but then realized I was still alive when I regained consciousness. I was in and out for some time and trapped in the vehicle for an hour while the jaws of life were used to extract me from the twisted wreck. I was then life flighted to UMass. Police were unable to reach my wife, so an officer went to our house to tell her what had happened and that they didn't know my condition. Route 20 was closed for hours after the accident. An officer later told me he thought I had two broken legs after he realized I was still alive, but he was unable to see my trapped lower body. In fact, I had suffered an open left elbow fracture and separation. Emergency surgery with hardware insertion was performed on my arm, and I've been recovering ever since. However, the real story here is not the extent of my injuries but rather how I managed to survive such an impact in the first place. An accident reconstruction expert who inspected the vehicles 
said he couldn't believe I survived the given damage. When I look at pictures of the mangled minivan, it's obvious that my injuries would have been much worse, if not fatal, had I been in a car without the Odyssey's crash protection features. So it's very, very rewarding when you can use your education to impact other people's lives. And those of you that are interested in engineering, um, feel free to ask me questions after this. I'd be happy to answer them. So I'll just, how much time do I have left? Thank you. <laughs> so I'll just quickly kind of go through um, what, like how I got here. How did I get to this position? Some of you may be wondering how old I am. I am 24 years old. I graduated Moraine when I was uh, 19, I believe. So when I was here, I had absolutely no major. I was thinking, oh, I'll be a nurse, I'll be a teacher, I'll be something, but not engineering. Uh, engineering just sounded really hard, so I didn't, I didn't go for it. But I decided on my major as soon as I graduated. <laughs> so I was a very late bloomer, didn't know what I was doing. Um, so basically, try and ask yourself these questions if you're struggling to find your major. Where's your passion? Where, what are you interested in? And what drives your passion? Um, Passion is like the most important thing. I can't stress that enough. You may be good at something, and you may just say, oh, I'll just do this for the rest of my life. But you may not be happy with it, and you may not be excited about it. So try and pick something that is, excites you. And I honestly was not very good at engineering. Um, I loved physics and math, but anything electrical, chemistry-based, I was like, eh, I can't do it. <laughs> so that's what turned me off from engineering. However, when you have a drive to pursue um, and get to a certain goal, you can do it. It took a lot of hard work. Maybe I studied an extra two hours than my classmates would have. But it was all worth it in the end because now I wake up every day, go to, out, go to work for you know, eight hours a day, and I'm excited to go because I love what I'm doing. Yes, there are challenges, there are obstacles. I'm still facing them but you can definitely overcome them as long as you want to be there. Um, so if any of you know, I'm from, so I'm from LSIP and I went to Allen B. Shepherd High School and then I graduated there and got the Distinguished Scholar Award. So I was able to come to Moraine Valley for free, uh, which is awesome. And uh, basically I did my two years here while I was taking two years to decide what major I would have. <laughs> graduated in 2009. Um, here are some activities that I did here. I did tutoring for two years. Uh, those of you that are math and science majors, I highly encourage you to be tutors, especially in the math department, because to be honest, like our brains forget stuff, so it's always good to help someone else um, with tutoring algebra or calculus. If you can teach someone else, then you know it yourself. That's what I always say. Um, and then Phi Theta Kappa, I do want to endorse this organization. It is an honor society, but the thing that's so important about it, if you are going to a four-year institution, make sure you join this club because they do service activities and you can just make a huge network of people. But the other reason is because the four-year institutions will give you $5,000 a year if you are in this organization during your community college years. Um, and then I went to Bradley University. Um, I worked my butt off to get scholarships. Uh, so I took my loan down from 87000 what it would have been, all the way to 25000 So the key here is just make sure you're working hard. And even if you don't have a lot of money, um, make sure to decorate your resume, is what I always tell people. The more that you have on your resume, the better. Um, don't join like a million clubs and put them all down, because employers are going to be like, so what would you do in this club? I don't know, I just attended meetings. Mm. No. Make sure that you are actually getting involved in that organization. That way you have something to talk about. And when you're involved in there, try and get a leadership position. Employers always like to see that you are willing um, to step up to the plate and take charge. Um, and those of you that are interested in engineering, make sure that when you go to your four-year to try and get an internship somewhere. My internship ended being at uh, Caterpillar, the mining company. Um, and then also, for those of you interested in engineering, Society of Automotive Engineers uh, is an organization at the four-year institutions. 
So if you love cars and love getting dirty and breaking things, definitely join this club. Um, you can help out the seniors with their projects. So we took this formula car and we took it on the racetrack and competed against hundreds of other colleges in the U.S. as well as all over the world. So you learn a lot of experience. And when you make friends with the seniors, they can teach you a lot of stuff that um, they can take you under your wing and basically just teach you how cars work and what to take apart, what not to do. And then also just remember to keep your hobbies going and time management is key. So you may um, wonder like, how did I do all of this in three years? Because <laughs> I spent three years at my four-year institution. So it took me five years to get a bachelor's. And some of you may be like, that is way too long to be in school. Because that's what I thought at the age of 18. Um, but it's definitely worth it. You know, take your time learning. Don't rush yourself. And the more, if you take five years in college, just make sure that you're spending time like in the garage helping out the seniors or in the labs helping other students get their projects done. Because the more you learn, even if it's outside the classroom, the better, the better off you're going to be. You're going to have more experience. And then um, if you're interested in engineering, these are some of the courses that I took. Um, mechanics and materials. I took uh, numerical methods. So if you guys know what Maple is, I know Maple was a software program we used here. Um, Maple is something that you can also have experience in and take to the four-year institution with you. And then some of my electives that helped me get into safety engineering were medical imaging, the human design, biomechanics, basically anything dealing with anatomy. And then I started at Honda about a year, year and a half ago. So, and these are all the testing that I am responsible for. Um, and then outside of Honda, I also do tutoring, again, just to keep the math skills up to par. <laughs> so um, I also want to go over this. If you need money for college, I have donated some money into a scholarship fund for those of you interested in engineering. So please, please apply because it's a lot of money, especially for a two-year degree, um, $1,000. So if you meet all of these requirements, feel free to apply and also submit your essay. Basically. I just want to know why you're interested in engineering, what you're going to do with it, and basically where's your passion in it. Um, the first recipient was Lauren Flynn. And then my awesome math professors, I like to thank them for helping me get to where I am. Sorry if you don't want your pictures up here, but they're up here. <laughs> I had Dr. Shrek and um, Mr. Ma Mrs. Madden and then Dr. Nab. And then if you have any questions, I think I've left some time for you guys to ask me. So feel free to do that. And afterwards, I will be up here so you can talk to me. And then there's a business card you can take if you are interested in getting a co-op or internship at Honda. Um, I also have a free gift for you guys. And then a seatbelt retractor that's torn apart so you can see how it works. And these are just some resources. Any questions? Before we do questions, how about a round of applause for me? And if you have questions, raise your hand. I will come to you so everyone can hear. It takes one brave soul to get, to get us started. How about something? Oh, there we go. All right. I was about to start calling on people. <laughs> Michelle, I don't think yes. I remember you from the tutoring center, but uh, tell me just a little bit about why you even did that. The tutoring? Yeah. Um, at Marine Valley. Yeah. Um, I really liked helping people, and my first passion when I was growing up was to be a teacher. So it was kind of like I was going to school, taking physics and math which is what interested me, but at the same time, I felt like there was a lack of, I need teaching in here somewhere, so tutoring was perfect. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Hi. Uh, I'm Ryan Nagel, I'm the Dean of Science, Business, and Technology. I wanted to thank you to, for coming today as, a, as no an problem. alum and uh, sharing your story with us and the scholarship, too. Is a, sure. It's a, it's a great experience, so thank you very much. Thank you. I also had a question. Um, 
typically in engineering, it, it's, it's a male-dominated field, as I'm sure you yeah. know. Could you talk a little bit about your experience as a female engineer and your path, pathway and some sure. of the tips and techniques for, for any of the interested female students yes, that, uh, that you could share? That's a very good point. Um, so yes, engineering is basically male-dominated field. Um, if you take any math classes here, the higher up ones like calculus and differential equations, you'll kind of look around the room and be like, uh, I might be the only girl here. There's a couple girls and that's it. But mostly it's going to be males. Um, I was very, I don't know, I, I was kind of scared <laughs> going into the four-year institution and being one of the very few females in my classes. However, as you start learning um, and going through your courses, you realize, hey, I can study too. I can ace these tests. You know, it may take me a little bit longer because I don't have the experience, but those of you girls that have mechanical aptitude, you know, it may be easier for you. Um, it basically doesn't matter what your gender is, you can do it. Just because it's male dominated doesn't mean like it needs to stay that way. Like girls can do it too. Um, the thing is, is for you ladies, don't be afraid to experience and just ask questions. Um, I know that when I was in school, I was like, I shouldn't ask this question. They're going to be like, oh, she's a girl. She doesn't know anything. But there's other guys that don't know anything either, right? <laughs> so just ask. And the other thing is don't be afraid to go up to your male peers and ask them for help. Like, they're, they're willing to help. You may not think so, but all it takes is for you to ask that one question, and, you know, they'll start, they'll start helping you. And then as you're going through your engineering courses, you realize the guys are coming to you. So... <laughs> You know, it's free for all. <laughs> everyone, everyone has to go through the hardships and the challenges. So you, you're your own person and just stick it out. You'll, you'll, do, you'll do well. Other questions? Um, I'm a, actually a potential engineering major as well as a physics major. What do you, is your um, kind of advice for that transition from community college to a four-year institution? I don't know how Bradley was, but I guess for okay. us, the, always the big thing is, okay, you're in a class right now with 300 kids. You have one professor, uh, you have TAs, you know. I mean, because right. we're kind of used to how Marine is now. How, right. What was your gap between the physics classes, like, you know, your 203, 204 here, mm -hmm. and then your classes next semester when you got to your university? I see. So Bradley University was 6,000 people. So actually, the class sizes were about... Um, the sizes that you would get here. Um, but I did have a couple classes in lecture halls, and I will say, I think there were probably about 80 to 100 of us. That's like big enough for me. I don't want anything larger. But going through those courses, it was a little bit more difficult to see the professors, but all you gotta do is just email them and make sure that you make an effort to go see them. Yes, I will admit it may be harder trying to see a professor outside of the classroom over at those schools but you know just like here you just got to make sure your professor is available and keep pushing they may say oh yeah we'll do it next week and then forget no just keep pushing so um, yeah just transferring over you're gonna realize like maybe some of the courses are a little bit more difficult but you also have to remember you're done with your gen eds when you graduate here you're actually entering in to your major courses um, the biggest thing that I found helpful for me was as soon as you get there, join organizations that you're going to enjoy. So join something in engineering, join something that's a hobby of yours, like, I don't know, running or baseball or something. Join, join those clubs and make connections with people. Because as soon as you have that friend zone, you start to feel comfortable. And then when you're going to classes, you're like, oh, I see familiar faces. Like, we can form study groups. You know, it just makes your whole experience a lot better transferring. Don't be afraid of the clicks. Like, just try and meet people in different clubs. There's other transfer students out there, I swear. <laughs> Good. Okay. Hi, Michelle. You did a great job. Um, this Saturday, I am running a math and science conference for fifth grade girls right here at Moraine. Are you available? <laughs> I will be in Ohio. <laughs> okay, no. What I'd like to know is just a few little things that we could relay to these fifth grade girls. I'm going to tell them a little bit about your presentation and your okay. history. But we try to get them in fifth grade before they 
get the idea that no, girls don't go into those fields. We like to yeah. get, catch them before middle school. So maybe just mm -hmm. two or three things that you can think about that might help encourage them. Yeah. Um, one of the things that helps, I think, is encouraging them to play with Legos. Because <laughs> Legos, you know, you can build stuff, you can be creative. Um, that, that is a, an activity that I've used in tutoring before when I tutor the younger kids, um, as well as just making games. So maybe building some kind of contraption where you can hold an egg inside, but it parachutes from you know a scaffold or something. So how, how can you cushion up that egg? So basically just doing certain activities, I think will help them get engaged. Because I think what a, a lot of girls like kind of steer away from engineering for is because, oh, this is really hard. I can't like be creative. I can't build things. Yes, you can. You can get dirty in the garage. Like, <laughs> you, you can do it. You just need that initial push to start. So just Were activities. They're right there, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> um, my dad, yeah, he works a lot on cars. Honestly. I had that opportunity growing up to work on them with them, but I did not. And I regret that so much. But um, encouraging like kids to help their parents out around the house, like, I don't know, fixing a windowsill or fixing a broken chair, stuff like that is going to really engage their thinking skills and just how they be can become more mechanically um, stable. Mm -hmm. One final question anywhere? All right. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. Good. Hello. Hi. I was curious, what are the emerging technologies and how that, in your field, mm -hmm. and how that's evolving? Oh, for that, safety? Yeah. What are some of the emerging technologies that are just coming into your field um, or how you're using emerging technologies in your field? Honestly, I can't say because <laughs> I get confused between what the public knows and what I know only. And we can't, we can't give away secrets, unfortunately. There's a, there's a confidentiality. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I can't answer that question. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. Top secrets. OK, how about one more round of applause? Thank you, Michelle. While we're talking about math, I just want to make a quick announcement. Tuesday of next week, we will have our zombie math presentation where our own mathematicians on campus will help us understand how pandemics and outbreaks happen in mathematical, using mathematical models um, and using zombie plagues as our example. So come um, next week. I don't want to give you the time because I don't remember it, but it's Tuesday. You can look it up on the website. Thank you all.